And I asked those 40 people what their ages were. Can you see the screen? All right. I asked those 40 people what their ages were. So the variable was ages. It's a continuous variable. And I made a little chart. And so along this bottom line here, which we call the x-axis, I wrote down the various age groups and I had them in intervals like this, let's say 20 to 25, uh, 26 to 30, 31 to 35, 36 to 40, 41 to 45, 46 to 50, and then I just did 50 and older because, you know, once you hit 50, everyone's the same, right? No, I'm joking. And the variable name is here, age. And this is what we call the x-axis. And I also made the vertical line. And on this vertical line, I put something we'll call frequency, which is just how many people in each group. And so um, maybe I would have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay. And let's say of those 40 people, I had three of them who were in this age category. And I had five in this age category. And to make this easier for drawing, I'm just gonna draw little bars around them because that's just a little bit easier, takes less time. So the five would actually go right up to here. I said that because this is where my five line is. And let's say I had, let me erase this X up here. There we go. Let's say that I had in this next category, ages 31 to 35, I had, let's say, seven people. And in the 36 to 40, I had eight. And in the 41 to 45, I had, let's say, right here. And let's say I had this. And let's say I had this. So you can see the graph here now, and it's easy to read. What age category had the most people, would you say? Thirty-six to forty. Yeah, thirty-six to forty had the most. We can see that we had not very many in the fifty plus. And if we had something like this, we would call, the graph that we just drew is called a histogram. And you'll work with this a little bit if and when you take stats, at least if you take it with me. And this is what it looks like, right? It forms this curve. And so we have the most people in the center groups. Now, if this was the population, would it be very likely that we'd get someone who was 90? That person would be way out here somewhere. And if this was the population and it like people taking college classes at Diné, let's say, let's say that's what this is. It would be very rare to get someone who's in this age category. And so when we're looking at statistics, everything we're doing in here is designed for statistics. We're looking at what are the odds of getting a particular value. Okay, and so we're always drawing these distributions and then comparing, let's say, an individual score with the distribution. Or maybe we're carrying, we're, maybe we're comparing two sets of scores. Maybe we're comparing a distribution of people, let's say, who got a medicine and maybe their scores on the illness were here. 
and were comparing their scores with the people who got in the control group, no medicine, and maybe their scores looked like this. And when we do statistics, we're just comparing how different is the mean, the average for this group from the mean for this group? How different is this? And we're asking ourselves, is it significant? Or is it possible that this just occurred by chance? It would be better to draw this in color and I'm actually gonna take a moment and draw the lines in different colors so they're a little easier to see. That would be the control distribution. And right here, we might have the treatment condition. Right in here, we have some overlap. Right? That's what we're doing in statistics, okay? And all of the research designs that we're thinking about now are designed to do this kind of statistics. So that's why we're changing and hopefully gonna ask you to take your statistics before you take your research because it'll be easier to understand. So if we're looking to put numbers to all of these things, then we have to be really careful about what it is we're counting. And so that brings us to our content for today, um, where we're gonna start today, which is something in statistics I call parsing the problem. It means taking a research problem and working out what exactly is being looked at. And we're gonna do this using some of the language from the statistics course. And I know this is kind of small. Let me send this out to you right now by an email so that if you can't see it on my screen very well, that you have it in your background. So I'm gonna just send this out to all of you in an email. All right, I just sent this out to you in an email and I'm gonna see if I can make it bigger also because it's really hard to see right now, but let's see if we do this, still kind of hard to see. Let me just see if I can enlarge that text any. Okay, so this is helping a little. All right, so let's see if we can make it do with this. Um, so this is just describing what we're doing. What we're going to do for each of these problems is we're going to um, figure out certain things. And we're going to figure out what the populations are. So what people or what groups are we actually comparing? I'm gonna move this up so that we can see the whole thing. What group are we actually comparing is the first thing we'll look at. So we're gonna look at who population one is and who population two is. So um, we'll do these in examples. Then we're gonna use these populations to figure out the independent variable. And then we're gonna figure out the dependent variable, what's being measured. Then we're going to figure out the operational definition we're gonna figure out the direction and we're gonna figure out the research and the null hypothesis. And these are all part of experimental designs. You can see in the images on the right side of the screen that we're always looking to see if a particular value is different from the population. So is the population one, the population we're interested in, is it higher than the normal population? 
Is it lower than the normal population? Is it rare that way? Are we not sure whether it's higher or lower? And so this is the kind of thing we're looking at. So let's go through some examples and this will all make a lot more sense. So let's imagine that Jordan has its hypothesis. She thinks that people exposed to two hours of full spectrum light in this kind of a device that you see in the picture would have lower rates of depression than the general population. So she must think that some kinds of depression are related to a lack of light. And so let's parse this problem out a little bit. So population one is the population that she's interested in. These are the population that she thinks if she does something, they're gonna be different. So I'm gonna just um, close off this ribbon so that we can see and I can write on this. So in this case, the population that she thinks is gonna be a little bit different is people. We always start with people. Those are populations exposed to two hours of full spectrum light. Those are the people that she thinks will be different in some way. Population two is who she's comparing them to. And in this case, she's comparing them to the general population, to people in general. I'm gonna skip the independent variable right now, and we're gonna come back to it. The dependent variable or the DV is what is being measured. So what does she think will be different about these people who've been exposed to light? Well, she thinks depression will be different. So the dependent variable is depression. Whoops, one of our things is missing in here. We're gonna come back to. We're gonna skip that one for now though, and we're just gonna to go to directions and tails. And the direction just mean, does she think that the dependent variable depression will be higher in people who have the sunlight? Or does she think it will be lower in people who are exposed to the spectrum light? Or is she not sure if it would be higher or lower? And in this case, this word lower means that it's, it's lower. It means that she does have a direction to the hypothesis and she's gonna be looking for a result in the lower end of the distribution. So if this image too shows depression scores, she thinks that people who have the light, population one, will have scores in the lower tail. So we're going to say this is a one-tailed test. She's only looking for scores in this lower part of the distribution. And so we put low, just one tail, not both tails, just the low tail of the distribution and one tail only. Our research hypothesis, we state as what she thinks will happen. In this case, it's almost written verbatim right here. I'm gonna just copy this and paste it. And our research hypothesis will be, people exposed to two hours of full spectrum light will, I'm gonna change that to will, have lower rates of depression than the general population. That's her hypothesis. The null hypothesis is what we actually test. The null hypothesis says, it's not gonna be any different. That people who have this light won't be different. And so we just add this word not to it. People exposed to two hours of full spectrum light will not have lower rates of depression than the general population. And then if we look at the images, we know that image two represents what she's looking for because she's looking for the word lower indicates to us that she is looking for scores in the low end, image two. So now we've covered what we do in stats. We look for all these for problem after problem after problem, and we actually run the statistical tests to see if it really is lower 
or if it's just on the low end, but it could occur by chance. So we look to be 95% certain generally in psychology or sometimes 99% certain that this wouldn't just happen by chance. So let's continue on for a moment and do a few examples like this. I'll do one more for you and then we'll start doing them together. And then we're gonna come back and do these things that we skipped this time. So let's do another example right here. Colea suspected that people who drank two alcoholics drinks in the evening would have greater anxiety in the morning than the general population. So I'll do this one again, and then I'll start inviting you to contribute via the chat box. So population one, the population that she thinks is gonna be different is people who drank two alcoholic drinks in the evening. Let's just write that in right here. People who had two alcoholic drinks in the evening. Who is she gonna compare them to? She's comparing them to the general population. So people in the general population. We're gonna skip independent variable for right now. And let's look at the dependent variable. What is she measuring? What she's measuring is anxiety. She thinks anxiety will depend on whether they had those two alcoholic drinks in the evening. The dependent variable is anxiety. We're gonna skip operational definition for right now. We'll look for direction. Does the researcher think that the people will have more anxiety or less anxiety, or she's not sure if it will be more or less? And in this case, we have this word greater suggesting that it will be um, more. Greater indicates a one-tailed test. She's only looking for scores in one end of the distribution and she's looking for scores in the high end. So we're gonna put a one-tailed high test. Our research hypothesis, again, we can copy it right out of here. And I, actually, I'm gonna be more clear about my dependent variable, morning anxiety. Our research hypothesis is right here. People who drank two alcoholic drinks in the morning would have greater anxiety, and I'm gonna put will have, because now it's a hypothesis, will have greater anxiety than in the morning than the general population. I think I'm gonna change this to morning anxiety. So it's a little less wordy. The null hypothesis that we're testing is the opposite. It says there's not gonna be any difference. Will not have greater morning anxiety than the general population. And the correct image in this case is image one. So I'm gonna crop that so that all we can see is image one. This is the image that we'd be looking for. So, um, now, what question do we have about what I've just done before we go on to have you do some examples with me? Does this make sense to you or does it seem confusing? Sean. Um, a, go ahead, Dr. Russ. Does this seem like it's starting to kind of make sense or does it really seem pretty confusing? It's beginning to make the gears move in my head. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's uh, what I imagine uh, as we go along the process, I have to get in line with uh, what we're talking about. 
Okay, I'm quite sure you will. Thank you for giving me that feedback. Does anyone else have any feedback at this time? Nice to see you, Jessica. Okay, let's do one together then. Um, let's do this one. So I don't know if you know what arachnophobia is, but it's a fear of spiders, okay? So this doctor believes, hypothesizes, that people with arachnophobia who have this deep fear of spiders, who watched cartoons of friendly spiders, would have different levels of spider anxiety than the general population of people with arachnophobia. So now my first question is, what would population one be? What is the population that this doctor thinks will be different in some way? And we'll start in this case with the word people. So people, how would we finish that? And let me just call on someone. Doris, can I call on you? Yeah. People with arachnophobia, something like that. People with arachnophobia. Is that the whole group that she thinks will be different? People with arachnophobia, or is there something else about them? Who watch cartoons? Yeah, people with arachnophobia who watch cartoons of friendly spiders. All right, silly, silly. That's her hypothesis. Doesn't matter if it's silly. Who are we going to compare these people who are watching the cartoons to? What is our population to? Can I call on Jessica? Seeing the population is people with anactophobia. It's people with arachnophobia in general, right? What is the dependent variable or what does this doctor think will be different in people who have watched the cartoons of friendly spiders? Virgie. What is she measuring? What will be different, does she think, if they watch the cartoons? Oh, I think Virgie had to go pick up her son. She told me about that. Um, Sean, what will be different? What is she measuring? Uh, they're measuring the levels of spider anxiety. Very good. Level of spider anxiety. And how about this direction? Does she think that the people who watch cartoons will have more anxiety? Or does she think that they will have less anxiety? Or will the anxiety just be different in some way? What's stated? And let's ask Tia. Her anxiety will probably be um, still there, but lower. Okay, that's what you think, but what does this researcher hypothesize? Does she think that the, re, does she, what does she state in her hypothesis? That the levels will be greater or the anxiety will be less or the anxiety will just be different? It's gonna be different. Just different. So in that case, it's, we would say it's a non-directional hypothesis, but we don't need to worry about that. We just know that she thinks the scores could be higher up here, or they could be lower. And so we're looking at image three. And since we have a shaded area in both tails, the high tail and the low tail, we call it a two tail test. Mm -hmm. 
The research hypothesis is stated right here. We'll make some minor changes, but let's see if we can just paste it in here. So here, who watched cartoons of friendly spiders, let's go with the word will, have different levels of spider anxiety than the general population. For the null hypothesis, we just restate that exactly the same way, but we add the word not. People with arachnophobia who watched cartoons will not have different levels of spider anxiety. And which image is the correct one for this researcher's hypothesis? Image one, image two, or image three? And three. go ahead. Someone said three, and that's correct. All right. So this is how we go about parsing these problems. Now, um, let's do another one and give you, uh, let's do a couple more of these so that you can have a chance to do it. Um, let me just see here. It's always hard for me to transmit things to you when you're in a group like this. So what I'd like to have each of you do If I send you this image by email, I think you need to work on this yourselves. So I'm gonna send it to you and put you into random pairs. Maybe I'll actually, so I'm gonna copy this and send it to you in your email so that you can all see it. And I'm gonna have you work in group of two or three and take a look at solving each one of these, do the whole thing on your own and um, see what you can do. So I'm sending this to you by email right now and just take about five minutes. If you don't get done, that's okay, but let's give you a chance to do this on your own. And then I'll tell you why I'm bringing this to you. Shortly, I'll tell you why I'm bringing this to you. So I'm pasting this image into an email. I hope you'll be able to see it. And I'm sending it to each of you. All right, and I'll form you. That should be coming out to you at this time. And I'm going to put you into groups right now. One moment, I'll tell you as soon as the groups are ready. And the rooms are open.
Para... Oh, oh. Okay. I think the other group will be back shortly. Suzanne? Yes. I, I still don't know how to um, do the email from this, so I'll let my daughter teach me how to do this. Oh, but yes, no, Doris, was, that would be was, so... Yeah, that would be important, Doris. Thank you. Um, all right. So um, I guess so. Hang on a second. I lost my. All right. So let me get this back up again because I seem to have lost it. Experiments and designs. There we go. Okay, so let me ask you. I don't know where it is. For some reason, I seem to keep losing it. Oh, I know why I'm losing it. I opened the wrong thing. All right, here we go. All right, sorry about that. All right, so let's um, go to the problem I gave you and see what we came up with. So population one, um, how did this go in your groups, first of all? Jessica and Tia, how was your group? Um, we, we came in, uh, we, we did it pretty easy, I guess. So I Good, good, good. That's what I want it to be easy. Um, yeah. Okay, population one then, Tia, what is it? Well, um, we came up with um, people who reviewed, people who reviewed videos of car accidents. All right, very good. What's population two? Let's go to um, Virgie. Or Sean? Uh, population two are, um, I believe, the general population. The, um, yeah, people in general, we can say. It's fine mm -hmm. to say general population. And what was the dependent variable, Jessica? Okay, the dependent variable is you. Yeah, help me. <laughs> okay. I lost my paper. The, I lost, misplaced my paper. <laughs> um, we came up with the to measure to measure the speed. Speed. Very good. Yeah. Um, the direction, are we looking for scores that are for speeds that are higher, lower, or just different from the general population? And let's call on Virgie, are you back yet? Doris, do you know it's, this one? Uh, it's um, lower. It's lower. So we're looking for a, a score in just one tail. So this will be a one tailed test and it'll be low. All right, what's the research hypothesis? Um, let's go to Jessica again. Oh, we're seeing on that one. Um, the people who view video, car crash videos, um, and to be more careful. Um, so let's state the hypothesis exactly like this researcher does. So being careful is sort of an inference. And so they're not, we don't know if someone's careful or not. All we know, all we're measuring here is one thing, we're measuring speeds. So that's what we have to write in our hypothesis. 
people who viewed car crash videos, what? Will. Who would like to finish that? People who will drive at slower speeds. Will drive at slower speeds than. General, general population. population. Yeah. The general population. And where will we add the word not for the null hypothesis? Between well and dry. Okay, let's do that then. So we'll not drive at slower speeds. All right, so this is the idea. Which image is the correct image? Um, going to uh, maybe Tia? Uh, I didn't go that far, but um, I'm trying to think. <laughs> um, let's give let's give her a minute here. We were about around that point, weren't we, Tia? So we were, yeah, we were we were, were looking, about around that point. Yeah, but look at it now and, and figure it out. We're looking for one tailed low. We're looking for a score in the lower end of the distribution. Which image represents that? Uh, image two. Correct. All right. So this is what you're going to be doing in some homework, but we're going to be adding two components because this isn't the stats class. This is the research class. So let's go ahead and see what we're going to add. So first off, we're going to add, we're going to go back to this first one and we're going to add the independent variable. So the independent variable is going to always be represented in this populations. Okay, so we're looking at what is the difference between population one and population two? What's the difference? Anybody? The measurement? Well, yeah, what's so different about hours, the difference? Uh, two hours of full spectrum light. Right, light exposure. Light exposure is the variable then, is the independent variable. And the difference would be to our, would be exposure, we can just say, versus, we'll always use this word versus, no exposure or versus um, unknown exposure because it's not stated. Unknown exposure. So do you see how we've taken this and we've made it nice and neat here? So our populations, are the people that we're studying that we're interested in. And the thing that varies among them is the independent variable. The other thing that we do in a research class is we define, we give operational definition to the variable. And so let's just take a quick review of what the operational definition is. So remember an operational definition, it's how we define something for research purposes. And so we wanna make sure that it's measurable. So we have to have something indicating what exactly we're gonna count. So it might be like a number, I put number twice, a score, a frequency, a time, a distance, but something that we can count. So that's the first criterion. The second criterion, a person would know exactly what to measure. So if I was watching for this, I would count, I would get really close to, if not exactly the same number that you would get because we know exactly what we're counting. So it's precise and it's valid. So if we look at the conceptual definition of the variable, what the variable means, then we would find out that this operational definition or what we're gonna count seems like it fits. It seems like it fits. So um, if we go and apply this in this example, we have to define depression. So we need to have something that we can count. And so I'm going to put a score because I know, I'm gonna put a score because that's a count, right? A score is a count. And what is the score going to be on? Well, I know that there's an inventory that measures depression. 
So I'm going to put score on, the name of it is the Beck Depression Inventory. I happen to know that. You could look it up and know it, but it's okay. I just know that this is how depression is normally measured. And does this seem, so is this measurable? I'd say yes, because it has a number, the score. Is it precise? Do I know exactly what scale I'm going to use? I'd say yes, we're gonna use the Beck Depression Inventory. And does it seem like the Beck Depression Inventory would measure depression? If it's a valid scale, the answer is yes. And so I'm gonna indicate that this is a validated scale. We know it measures depression. And so this is a good operational definition. Short, but it's a good one. Let's go on to the next example. The next example, um, I'm going to invite you to identify the independent variable. So the independent variable is what is different between population one and population two. So give it a moment. What's the difference between those two groups? And let me see what um, Sean thinks. What's the difference between population one and population two? Well, um, one of them uh, drinks. Okay. Uh, two, two, two in the morning and the other in the evening. Or, or I don't, yeah. we don't know anything about, all we know about is population one. They drink two alcoholics drink in the evening. <clears throat> so we might say the independent variable, then the thing that's different is alcohol consumption, evening alcohol consumption. And what is the difference specifically? We'll put a colon and we'll write two drinks versus unknown drinks, because we don't know what the general population does. Uh, Dr. Russ? Yes. Um, on this problem, it says uh, two alcoholic drinks in the evening would have greater anxiety and, oh, okay, I'm oh, sorry, I read it wrong. Yeah, we, like, we should change this in the problem, morning anxiety. <laughs> okay, well, it was my mistake, Dr. Russ. But that is a better way to state the problem. This is why language really matters, how we state things. Okay, so now let's go to the operational definition, morning anxiety. So um, I'm going to just tell you that there is an anxiety scale that's validated, and it's called the state trait anxiety scale. And it measures, it's valid, and it measures how much of an anxious person you are, all, like in general. And it measures also a second measure, how anxious are you in this moment, your state of anxiety in a given point in time. And so we can use this as an operational definition. We can put score on the state, on the valid dated state trait anxiety inventory. And then if we check, is this measurable? Yep, we have a number, we have a score. Is it precise? Yes, we're going to use exactly this tool. And is it valid? And the answer is yes. So those are our, that's our litmus test. But not everything has a scale. So let's go on to spider anxiety. There's not a particular scale for spider anxiety. So let's see what we can do with this one. So let's start by defining the independent variable. And I'm gonna, just for the moment, erase our hypotheses, just so we can see it a little bigger. Our independent variable is, how would we say this? What's different between these two groups? What does group population one have that population two does not have? Jessica.
And you guys hear me or no? Yep. Okay, then. Um, the independent variable has um, Mm. It's about arachnophobia. Um, so in population one, we have people with arachnophobia. And oh, yeah. in population two, we have people with arachnophobia. Oh, What's normally, different? Uh, people who are in that, who don't have arachnophobia? Nope. We're comparing these two populations. Population one people with arachnophobia who watch cartoons of friendly spiders. We're comparing them with population two, people with arachnophobia in general. So if this, I'm gonna make it bold, is the same as this, then we have to look for what's not the same, what's different. So what's different, Jessica, in population one? Just as it's stated. Those to watch cartoons of the friendly spiders? They're watching cartoons of friendly spiders. So let's name the variable friendly spider spiders. exposure, maybe. <laughs> Something like that. They're seeing these cartoons of friendly spiders. And we'll call it video versus, or we'll call it cartoon, cartoon versus no cartoon versus we'll assume no cartoon in the general population because that's not a common thing. So that's the independent variable and you can see how it just defines what's different about those two populations. Now we know what we're measuring is spider anxiety, but we don't know how to measure it. So let's think about what our operational definition could be. If you had to measure how anxious someone was around spiders, how would you do it? How can we tell if we're watching someone, how can we tell if they're getting anxious? Can you tell? Can you tell uh, Virg Virgie when your son is getting anxious? If you look uh, at him, how yeah, can you by his body language. <laughs> okay, can you be more precise in a way that if I looked at him, I could tell too? Uh, he's probably playing with something or mm -hmm. like. All right, he's he's maybe looking away. I could look at his eyes and see where his eyes are looking, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Any of you can tell when someone is anxious. Let's just brainstorm a little bit because I don't have an answer. How can you tell when someone is anxious? I'm gonna ask every one of you to give us just one way you can tell if someone is anxious. Jessica, how can you tell if someone is anxious? Um, like how they play with their hair or play mess around with their hands or something like that. Okay, so fidgeting, we'll call it that. Tia, how can you tell a different way now? How can you tell if someone is anxious? Um, they talk a lot. Okay, they talk a lot. Okay. Um, how about you, Sean? Let's even expand it to like um, fear, like afraid or anxious. How can you tell if someone is afraid or anxious? Mm. I used to have a co-worker that said uh if you're in fear run and run and run the, how do you say it run and be scared like uh scream like a little girl that's what he would say because okay. that means the uh, scream out loud because you're scared uh anxiety would probably be not okay. to scream but to uh fidget scream like, uh, kind of uh jittery Okay, um, jitter, I don't know quite how I observe that exactly. I know what you mean, mm -hmm. I'm trying to think of how to write it. Um, Doris, how can you tell if someone is anxious? Uh, maybe like scared. 
yeah, but how can I tell if someone is scared? If I'm looking at you or if you're looking at your daughter, how can you tell if she's scared? Uh, kind of like uh, paranoid. <laughs> Okay, but how can I tell just by looking? This is the trick of operational definitions. We have to be able to see it. Avoid eye contact. Avoid eye contact, maybe? Okay, now let's yeah. imagine that you're someone who's really scared of spiders and I show you a spider. What reaction might you have if you're afraid of spiders? Probably not Scream. the talk a lot one, I don't think. Scream. Scream, okay, the scream might be. What else might you do? Scream and jump. All right, <laughs> I think we'd have, okay, maybe we'd freeze or maybe we'd jump. That kind of, probably we'd back away, I'd say, right? Yeah. Back away. How about, how about away. run away? How about run away? Run away? <laughs> yeah, we'd get away. All right, let's just stay with these two because these both seem observable, right? So let's start there. So we're looking in some way, we're gonna have, we're gonna show these people spider, get the spider right up close to them. And we're gonna observe, we're gonna have to count something. So we could, what could we count as far as backing away? How far they back away? How quickly they backed away? What do you think? Hey. Sean, I think you said something and I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear you. Russ. They sorry. hide, they run underneath something. <laughs> okay, all right. But what can we count? Well, let's use backing yeah. away. That's a really nice, obvious one. How far are they back? Could we measure that? Could we count like the number of feet? So let's put number of feet a person backs or, or um, distances. Let's say the distance. Number of feet a person moves away from, moves away when shown a spider. That would be one way of measuring it. Is it measurable? Yes, we have a number. Mm -hmm. Is it precise? If I was looking at it, would I know what to look for? And would you look at, would you looking at it know, be able to also know what to look for? Or is it like, if you're looking, you might see something different than I am. You might interpret moving away differently. I think we'd have to assume that there were some marks on the floor and that when the person was shown a spider, they were standing in a particular, like they had their foot in certain footprints. And then when they moved away, we had maybe markers on the floor, like foot markers so that we could count. I think then we could get it pretty precise. Does it seem, so I think it is precise. Does it seem valid? Does it seem like this is a valid measure of spider anxiety? Dr. Russ? Yes. Um, my screen went blank, so I had to get it fixed at this technical issues, but wouldn't you use the, that particular uh, test for anxiety? Would that even, would that work for here, but just compare it to uh, correlate it with the spider, I guess? I think that's a good idea. And there might be a way to adapt a scale and use self-report. Um, yeah, we would we could say something like that. So Sean is suggesting he might operationalize it by using a um, adapted the score on the adapted let's make sure he's play, say score score on the adapted 
version of the, it's abbreviated STAI, and we probably only want the state measure of the state dimension of the STAI. This would be a good definition too. We're trying to get, you know, we're trying for both of these. So I think we could also say that this number of feet a person moves away when shown a spider would be a behavioral indicator. And I do think it's valid. We all said backing away would be a reaction someone would have. So that's valid. There might be a better way to do it, but at least we do have an operational definition. Let's continue on and look at this one. Let's start with the independent variable. Um, in this, we are comparing, I'm gonna erase this last again so we can get it bigger. In this, we're comparing people who viewed videos of car accidents with people in general. So people exist in both population one and population two. So what's the difference? What does population have or what have they been exposed to that population two has not? The people who view videos of car accidents. Okay, so the variable then is exposure. We're exposing them to car accident videos. That's what's different about them. And if we were going to compare the groups, we would just say um, video viewing versus no viewing. We can assume maybe that the general population hasn't watched it. Now we have to define speed. Let's just, so how are we going to go about doing this? We have to get an operational definition. And let's assume that this Officer Warren has this stretch of road that's really dangerous that he's worried about. So let's say that we get to do this on a particular half mile stretch of road. So that'll help us a little bit. So how exactly are we going to measure speed? So let's say we're police officers and we have, this is Officer Warren, and he has that radar gun. We can use that tool. How could we write this? How could we use words very carefully to write this operational definition? Speed is just too vague. Speed where? How are we gonna measure speed? Is it miles per hour, kilometers per hour? How long? Are we gonna measure it for 50 miles, 10 miles, one mile? First off, what are we gonna count? What's the number gonna represent? Is it gonna represent a time? Would it be how fast they're going? Yeah, and so we would be measuring it in what, what units of measurement do we use? Miles per hour. Miles per, Miles hour. per hour. Okay, and should we focus on, at, let's, what tool are we gonna use to measure it? The radar. Mm. Measured by the radar gun. And how long are we gonna measure it for? Are we gonna measure it on this particular half mile stretch of road that is a dangerous stretch? Yeah. Okay. And we'll have that marked somehow. So now we know. Now that's pretty clear. So do we have something we can count? Yep, we have a unit of measurement, miles per hour. Um, we have a tool that we're using. It's pretty specific. We're going to use a radar gun and we're going to have this particular half mile stretch of road. I, I'm not sure exactly how that works, but I'm I don't know. And then it doesn't matter for me, but the officer would have to know. And is it valid? Does this seem like a reasonable indicator of our dependent variable speed? And I think it does. So that's our operational definition then. So operational definitions can be fairly short, 
but they have to have a, something that represents a number. They have to have something that tells exactly what we're gonna be counting. And we have to have it represent the variable of interest. So all of this I did by way of wanting to show you the operational definitions for on the test, because I think I would like you to give this another try, almost, almost everybody, but let's take a look and see what we think together. So I have all of the answers up here. And I reminded you of what an operational definition was. And I was thinking when I wrote that question, I was thinking I'd see something like this. You didn't even have to put the conceptual definition. I think one of you or maybe more did, which was good. But the operational definition then, I thought I'd see something like this. We'll be counting the number of minutes an individual spends helping a stranger who would be a Confederate understand directions to a hard to find location. So we're gonna have a Confederate who's pretending to be lost and to be confused and so forth. And they're having trouble and how long does a person spend helping them? <laughs> now, I thought this wasn't good enough because what is helping, right? How do we define helping? So I said, what we're gonna look for specifically is we're gonna look for them conversing with a stranger. So we're gonna have like a video camera on them and we'll watch whether they're conversing with the stranger. We'll count as helping if they're both looking at the same thing together, if both the stranger and our subject are looking at the same thing, like a map or something. If, they're, if um, the participant is writing or drawing while the stranger observes, or if the participant is gesturing with hands to the stranger. So all of those things will be considered helping. Is this measure, uh, is it measurable? Yes, we have a number of minutes. Is it precise? I think so. We have particular things we're going to look for. And does it seem like it fits the conceptual definition of generosity? I think so, because the conceptual definition is the spirit and action of free, freely and frequently giving to others. I think this could be a reasonable, um, a reasonable operational definition. And so Let's just look at those criteria, write them down if you haven't. Measurable, precise, valid. That's what we're looking for. And so I wrote down what we wrote here and let's look for first if it's measurable in this one. And so this is the first definition. Means to be kind to people. And when you go out to a family gathering to make sure you are giving gifts, um, another way to help out a friend or family when they need help, this is just means that you or anyone can be generosity to anyone you love or care about. So let's just read silently and let's see if there's something we can count here. If in an experimental situation, does this meet the criterion of measurable? Do we have anything indicating a number? No. I'd say no. I think we have a really nice conceptual definition with lots of really good examples. So I would compliment this person on that. Um, I don't think we have any number though. Mm, Is it precise? If I am... Let's say we have a camera and maybe this is a camera on the person the whole time. Do I know exactly what to look for and what to count as evidence of generosity? Or is it possible that if I look at the video, I might see something different, count something different than if you look at the video? I like all the good examples. But I think in an experimental condition, we might need to, I mean, it depends on what the study is. We could count all these acts of generosity, but even things like et cetera suggests that you might count things that I wouldn't count. And so I think it's not precise. We have to be really precise. If I'm observing this, I have to know exactly what to count. So I think that 
it's not precise. Is it valid? Does it seem like these examples are indeed examples of generosity? Um, well, um, if you're watching a video, then you can find a number on a birthday cake. Um, I'm sorry, but what was the birthday cake thing you said? Your uh, age, the number on the birthday cake. Yeah, but that's not what I mean. What I mean is we're oh. interested in measuring generosity. And I cannot put a thermometer into someone's mouth to measure generosity, right? No. I cannot hold up a ruler to measure generosity. How could I measure generosity? I can measure generosity by looking at, let's just take a step back from this because you make a good point, Doris. Um, so I can measure generosity. This is what I wanna study. Maybe I think that, um, that people who feel loved will act in more generous ways. And I wanna test the hypothesis. Are people more generous when they feel loved? So how am I gonna measure generosity? And so let's think about this a minute. Wouldn't it be nice? Then people could feel loved more and we have a more generous population. So I'm looking at a number that would be a measure of generosity, something I can count. Or a score or a distance, or a time, something like this. But it has to have something like this, but it has to relate to generosity. And then it has to be um, precise so that everyone who looks at it sees the same thing. So that it's not like if I'm watching, I count something different than you're counting. And it has to be valid. It has to really, the behaviors or whatever it is we're looking have to actually measure generosity, the conceptual definition. And in the example we just looked for, I would say that no, we didn't really have anything that was countable. And I'd say probably not precise enough, but I would say, yes, very valid in terms of the examples given. So if I was going to rate it, that's what I would say about this example. What do you guys think? Does that make sense to you if we were assessing this? Yeah. I hope so. And then taking great care to choose your words carefully. So I don't know. I'm just trying to help. I'm just trying to make this clear. This one, um, let's see if this one meets the criteria. The number of times a fellow classmate helps another classmate in need. Is it measurable? Do we have a specific, is there any indication of something we're going to be counting? The number of times. I'd say this is a, yep, I'd say measurable. We kind of are good. Um, is it precise? Would I know exactly what to count if I was watching a video of our participant? What do you think? Any yeah. Okay. What would you be? What would you be counting? <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> the number of classmates. Okay, maybe a number of different classmates. Differently, yeah. Oh, okay, possibly. How do I know that they're helping? How do I know what helping is? I think we might, I think we 
might need to get a little more precise on this one because I think that if we were all yeah. watching a video, like how would we know what helping is? Like, okay, we know that if our student bends down at another student's desks and points things out to them, it probably is helping, right? I guess that's one incident. What if he helps? What if he stays with that one student the whole time? That's pretty helpful, but we're only counting the number of incidents, so that would just count as one, right? So if he spends 30 minutes helping someone, it still just counts as one. So I don't know if the number of incidents, but maybe that's okay. Um, is it helpful, let's say a fellow student is making a speech and our student of interest smiles and nods at that person. Is that helping? Is that generous? Should we count that? Yeah. I mean, yeah, we should, but how do we know? What if I decide yes and Virgie, she's hardcore. She says, no, that doesn't <laughs> qualify. You know, what is helping? So I think we need a little more precision. Is this valid? Does it seem like this idea, helping a classmate in need, is this a good example of generous behavior? Yes. I think so too. I think this one is valid, check. I think it's measurable, at least we know we have a number indicated. And I think we need work on precision because I don't think I know exactly what to count here. Let's look at another one. The action someone does something for another person, such as helping out an elderly, someone in need, volunteering, and donating to different organizations. Do we have an indication of a number, a score, a time, a distance, something to, something that the numbers are going to represent? Mm, no. I don't think so either. I don't think so either. I don't think we met the measurable criterion. How about valid? Let's go to that one. Does it seem like this is valid? Are these examples that are provided, do they seem like they are reasonable things that a generous person would do? Yes. I think yes, we meet this one. This one is okay. This one, no, I don't think we're there yet. How about precise? If I'm trying to count these now, do I know exactly what I'm counting? My answer would be it's not precise. It's too vague. Like, is this it? Are these all the things we're counting? Who is someone in need? Is my, is my child in need? You know, does that count or does it have to be a stranger? And how do I, I think this is not precise. Okay, this one starts out with the conceptual definition. So starting in the second bullet point, the conceptual dis definition for generosity, um, qualities of giving, helpful. So we have the conceptual definition. Mm -hmm. Then we go on to the operational definition. The amount of time someone donated materials to a person in need of assistance. Do we have something that we're going to be putting a number to? Does this meet that criterion? Um, yes. I think, yeah, we're looking at a frequency. The number of incidents is what we're going to count. Um, do we know what we're observing? Mm -hmm. Or is it precise? Um, what about the donating materials? Yeah, yeah, I think we'd need, I think we're getting close. I think we'd need to know like in what time frame, like over the course of a year, or are we talking about like during a food drive or what, what exactly, like, I think we need to know the parameters of this. Like are, a week long period or so what am I actually going to be counting, you know, so we need a little more precision mm -hmm. on this. Does this seem like a valid indicator of the, is this something that a generous person would do? Is it valid? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. All right. Ooh. So the thing that is problematic in this answer, um, 
I think there's extraneous information. Like, I'm not sure what this IV <clears throat> is written in here. I'm not sure the DV, I'm not sure that's, so I think this has a lot of, I don't exactly know what this is and how it's relevant. And the other thing I would like to see is um, a little more care with spell, with spelling, writing more like a professional in this one. Go on to um, the next one. This is the last one. This person, actually there's one more, but I will skip it because that, um, for now. An operational definition is collecting data that is measured by students and family. Students and family in class wearing masks in public will measure by scores. Number of students and family that wear or not wear masks in public count students that are in class by gathering numbers wearing masks. What do we think? We have an attempt at measurable, right? Numbers of students. <laughs> That sounds like something we're going to be counting. Is this valid? Does it have to do with generosity? What do you think? So it's a little bit tough, right? I think that this person, I think that this could be a measure of generosity. Some people wear masks to protect others. So I think we could build the case that this is valid. Um, I think though that this person would have to build that case, would have to establish a little bit more that he or she is writing about generosity. You know what I mean? And then is it precise enough? Like, would we know if you were told, okay, go out and measure this now, would you know exactly what to do? You're, you're counting the number of students and family. Does this tell us how generous an individual? I think that this is troubled on all three levels. It's, 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 we have the attempt at a number. We're supposed to count students. But I don't know how counting these students is going to tell us someone's level of generosity. So I think this is a, a little bit of a confused answer. So, yeah. So I wanted to go through these with you because it's really important that you understand this concept. And so what I would like, I think um, anyone, I think everyone should just do this another attempt on this one question on an operational definition. So I've got two homeworks for you, and then we're going to go talk about stereotype threat um, a little bit. But I had to get through this with you first. Was this helpful at all, you guys, in understanding what we're doing here? Mm, yeah. A little helpful. It's still not going to be easy right away because it's like, it's like me learning to speak the Navajo language. Like, it's going to be hard at first. You're learning a different language. That's why it's worth just taking the time to learn it. And so what I would like for each of you to do is I have an assignment posted. I'll show you what it is. Um, and it is just like what we did for our class. So let me pull it over. This is what the assignment looks like. I've posted this up already and you need to download this sheet and you're going to be um, following these examples. So I did a couple of them right here. And you're gonna be doing it for these remaining problems. So you're gonna fill in these blanks, just what we did in class. I wanna see how well you're knowing this. And there's, I think it goes up to number nine. Yep, it goes up to nine. And um, then I also want you to redo the operational definition. And I want you guys to choose the variable that we're gonna define. We're gonna do it together because maybe you don't like my variable, but I'll choose, you can, guys can give me ideas, but I'll choose among them so I can get one that seems reasonable. So let's just choose a variable that you think might be a good one to measure. Um, in these online examples, I'll read you what these are. 
people, th Dr. Apple thought that people who lived within one mile of a store with affordable fresh vegetables would eat more vegetables than people in general. So here, the dependent measure is how many vegetables people eat. Arturo thought that children with autism who were given responsibility for a class pet would develop greater empathy. Here's an empathy as a dependent variable. All right, so um, those are just a couple of ideas. So can you think of some attribute that you think it would be interesting to operationalize? We're looking at stereotype threat articles. We're gonna be doing that next week as well. How people feel when stereotypes about their group are activated. I'm kind of wondering what you think or would you rather I just choose the variable? I'll just choose it unless you have an idea. Sean, Tia, Jessica, Virgie, Doris, any ideas for a variable? Nope. <laughs> okay. I want everyone to do that assignment before the next class though. And we have just five minutes left. And I wanna just hear a little bit from you about the stereotype threat article, because I didn't, I meant to do this today, but then when I looked at the tests, I really thought I better go back and, and kind of teach this a little bit. So what did you think about that? Um, Sean, could I get some thoughts from you on that article that you read up to study two? The stereotype article. The stereotype threat. Did you read it or not, Steele and Aronson, that I emailed you? Yeah, I did. Uh, I'm trying to process what I just read. I also was going back to your practice uh, things. I I apologize. I I did read it. It's just I think I need a time manage with all my other. Uh, that's okay. Uh, assignments with uh, my other classes. Uh, I I think I better defer my uh, my little um, answers to my classmates here, okay. if I could. That's all right. My worry is just that you're going to forget next time, and I know some of you actually did this. So I I really hope you can just put some highlights because now I won't see you again for a while. Jessica, talk to me a little bit. I see you have the article. Anything that you noticed about it or words that you found confusing in it or anything, any comments? Oh, uh, John said it was a lot of cautious. I mean, like there were some things that really stood out to me, which kind of triggered, I felt like I was triggered or something. Okay. Um, but it took a lot of the process, but I I'm still not almost fully done with it, but I mean, like, Kind of, there's some parts that I had to recollect really and get away from it for a bit, so. Yeah, it's like you have to read every single sentence one at a time, right? And then say, yeah. okay, did I understand that sentence? <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, I mean, like, there were some, there were some triggers to me reading it at the same time. Like, I was like, okay, then take a break from it, go back to it, kind of don't overwhelm yourself with this kind of information. <laughs> I know. Because like, it, um, well, it was a little overwhelming at some parts, but um, yeah, I had to get and we're going to be doing more of this. So, um, so if you haven't, I'm going to probably, I'm going to want you, I think, to read the same thing again before our next class, and I'll remind you, Virgie, what was your experience with this? Um, I thought it was interesting how they did the experiment with. Um, I think they did it both with with um, males on the first one. Mm -hmm. And then on the second one, they only used women. Okay, so what you noticed is that when they did their first, they did an experiment, you noticed or observed that they changed the population of interest. Yeah. So you'll, you'll be seeing as we work through this, how these ideas advance, because I'm gonna be sharing other articles with you. Um, yeah, so, um, that's a good thing. And were there any words that you wanted to highlight for us before we sign off here? I know we're getting on that last minute here. You said you came across a couple of words that you had to look up. Yeah, um, the first one was covariate. Okay, um, covariate. yeah, <laughs> a statistical word, yeah. Um, so when you're reading these articles, 
you're going to come across the method where they're going to tell you exactly what they did. And you'll be learning what these words mean a little more. And then you're going to come to the results. And the results are usually, if you can believe it, the hardest part to read. Because this is where they talk about the statistics. Okay. So don't get too stressed if you don't understand the results exactly. But do read them. And then you'll come down and after the results, they're going to tell you what these results mean a little bit. So let me see if they do this here. And it's in the discussion section. And that's where they're going to tell you what these results mean. And so you're going to try to read these results. Let me tell you a couple things you can look for. Whenever you see this P less than something, that means the probability of getting this result is less than 1%, or it means it was significant. Okay, so um, then this discussion will lead you to the next experiment and they'll give you a nice detail. You should be able to understand method. You should be able to understand discussion. You should be able to understand the first part, the literature review. It's a little harder with the results. Yeah. So write down, you have a couple of assignments. Everyone jot down. I'm going to put them up online too. Three assignments. One, reread this article. And um, again, pay attention to this method, how they did the study. Two, read chapter four, whole thing. And three, complete the practice exercise. And there's a number four that some of you will do. Actually, all of you are going to retake that part two of the test. So there's a number four is to redo the test if you um, and everyone needs to redo the operational definition part, even though some were pretty good, you might not have that much to do. And then some of you are going to have to also redo some parts of the multiple choice and I will send you they're posted right now and I'll send you information about which ones you need to retake because um, I need to have all of you pass on that too. Okay. So the test, you'll hear from me on email. And then reading the chapter, rereading this article I sent you, and completing that worksheet that I showed you. I'll make sure that's clearly posted. Right now I'm gonna do that. I'll make sure it's clearly posted on Blackboard for you too. Okay. Thanks. So Dr. Russ. Yes. Is it chapter four or chapter five that you wanna see? Let me double check. I think it's four, but let me just look in the book. Sometimes I get these numbers mixed up. Is the one that says five. experimental yeah. designs is what it is. Okay. It's um, called experimental designs, and I think it's chapter four. So I'll make sure that's all clear too. Then I have midterm grades coming up for you. We're not having a midterm exam. And so all of your practice assignments will count a little more heavily so that I can assess what it is you know about the content that we're covering right now. So don't get behind on work at this time because we have only one more week to do um, what we need to do for the midterm grades, okay? So watch for an email from me. I'll send it before I walk my dogs here tonight so you all know just what to do. And um, I hope this is helpful. See you next time. I'll be out of town next week, Jessica, Doris. Okay. 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 Bye, everyone. You can hang around Bye. if you have questions. <laughs>